Welcome to Manwa Furi. Manwa starts with the most beautiful greenery appearing before us as the sun begins to hide behind the enormous mountains. With its last rays, it illuminates the forest and four pink crescents are visible in the sky. We see a girl sitting on the back of a man who is running at full speed. They rush among the bushes along a large avenue, food blessed by the fading sun. The girl is wearing a long cloak and her head is covered with a hood. She was turning to the Lord at that moment, saying that if he actually exists, she was really asking for help. The red-haired girl clutches onto the gray-haired guy, who rushes with all his legs, holding her on his back. She was really hoping for the Lord's help, at least this time just for today. Her arms were crossed over the young man's chest, and she was trembling. Suddenly, something was flying at them, right behind them, through the forest floor. A glowing and electric arrow flew near the girl's face and hit her. The girl was dumbfounded by what was happening. The arrow hit the tree they were running near at the time. The arrow was quite long. The young man and the girl on his back stopped and looked at this arrow sticking out of the tree. The girl looked at it with wide eyes. She was trembling all over. The electric arrow had left a long gash on her cheek, which was bleeding and the hood of her face had been cut and the fabric was electrified. The girl mentally realized it was him. She fixed her green eyes on the top of the mountain. There stood a man with an electric bow, Rahik. He looked grave and his gaze was fixed on the girl. Their gazes met. A frightened look on the girl's face and a serious, slightly frowning look on the man's face. The girl immediately turned to the young man who was carrying her and told him that they should head northwest. She added that it should be done without stopping. The guy looked at the girl attentively and was silent. She, too, looked back at him silently and slightly innocently. It had been six months since she had been drafted into this unbelievable world. Blood was oozing from the wound on her cheek. The girl fixed her gaze on the young man. His body was covered with many minor wounds, as well as the deep wounds that had already healed into scars on his muscular body. The girl wiped the wound on her cheek with the back of her palm and thought that if her plan failed, she would be sobbing in the crown prince's bed today after being victimized and losing her virginity. The girl pulled her hood more tightly around her and pressed herself against the young man, who was clearly surprised by her actions. She also thought about the fact that if nothing had succeeded, she would have gone mad day after day just waiting for her death. Suddenly, the young man turned slightly and grabbed the girl's arm, which took her aback. The next moment, he pulled her and the girl found herself not on his back but in his arms. She clutched herself and pressed herself against his chest. They rushed on. The girl noticed that instead of what might have happened, she was being carried away in the arms of another man. His name is Vikon, and he is the one trying to protect her. He rushed with all his might and held the girl behind his back. The girl herself clung to him more tightly and clasped her hands on his back. She opened her eyes and looked back at Rahik, who was still standing on the top of the mountain. She realized that Vikon was the one whose actions had provoked the crown prince. Rahik's eyebrows moved to the bridge of his nose as he stood atop the mountain. He looked at the girl who was being carried farther and farther away by Vikon with an angry frown. We went back six months to a place called the Divine Sanctuary where there were a number of open coffins with bodies in them. The girl who was there exhaled heavily. She said aloud that she couldn't believe she had to work on her day off because of the water vase she had broken. She was standing next to the coffin of a red-haired girl. The girl, a clerk, wondered aloud who she should blame. She made an unhappy face and tears were streaming down her face. She asked whether she should blame herself or the archbishop who had appeared at such an unfortunate moment for her carelessness. She sadly noted that her life was not filled with rainbows and butterflies, but it was clearly better than those divine vessels that lay in coffins in the divine sanctuary. Last week, since the end of the ceremony, if the vessels don't wake up, they'll be returned to their families. The shrine is sure to be disappointed by this, for they have offered every possible prayer for a thousand days to hold the summoning ceremony. But not a single vessel woke up, 
Suddenly, the red-haired girl began to frown and squeezed her eyes harder. The attendant stared at her with wide eyes, not realizing what it was if she had imagined it. Suddenly, the red-haired girl began to make sounds, and the servant immediately burst into tears, shouting that she was moving, not believing it. In the next moment, a bell in the shrine began to ring with all its might, announcing that the sacred creature had appeared. Someone shouted at the top of their lungs that the chosen vessel was poached, but immediately quipped that it was the Ramo family's daughter from Summer Hedge. We see the memories of this very vessel from another life. The girl yells that it's all about her, her sister, and she, therefore, doesn't want to see her. After which she asks her sister if she heard her, and she yells at her to get the hell out of this house. It was pouring rain outside. The girl stood next to the roadway, which was busy with a large number of cars. She clearly remembered arguing with her younger sister about their journey in a past life, so she ran out of the house. She stepped out into the roadway, right in the middle of traffic, in a place where there wasn't even a crosswalk, as cars rushed down the street. She didn't remember what happened after that. In the next instant, the red-haired girl opens her eyes. She is in a luxurious room. Standing next to her, there is the very maid who noticed in the divine shrine that this divine vessel had come to life. She inquired how she was feeling. The girl gushed that she thought this divine vessel was confused right now. She shared that her soul and body are separated for now, but in a couple of days, everything will be fine. The red-haired girl looked puzzled at the clerk, mentally wondering who this girl was and if she was a foreigner because she couldn't understand what she was saying. The girl felt her throat hurt so much, she couldn't make a sound, nor could she move. The attendant took the girl's hand and began kneading it, saying that she had been told that you should massage your hands as soon as you arrive because a vessel doesn't feel its body well. The redhead assumed it was a nurse. A moment later, the clerk sat the girl on the bed. The red-haired girl wondered if she was now in the hospital. Someone wondered aloud if the girl was awake, which was a vessel. The attendant froze upon hearing this, and her eyes widened. A golden-haired man asked the question. He shared that he couldn't believe that the vessel from the summer hedge had been chosen. It even gave him a headache, but he asked the girl not to worry because now it belonged to him, so now her value would be significantly increased. The red-haired girl looked at him carefully, wondering what kind of man this was. He stared back at her intently. The man asked the clerk if the girl had eaten anything. She answered that no, not yet. The man sat down on the bed, continuing to look at the girl carefully, and smiling, responded well. He turned to the clerk, telling her to send a letter to the Ramo family and tell them that the poisonous flower of the summer hedge, the red-haired divine vessel, had finally bloomed. The man added for the servant to also say, in the letter, that their daughter had been sold to the highest bidder. The servant shouted and asked His Highness if he was sure he wanted to say such a thing to Duke Ramo. His Highness looked at the servant with a furious look that made the girl frightened. The man ordered her to write exactly what he said. The girl bowed and stammered and answered positively to His Highness. After that, the servant left the room and the red-haired girl was left alone with His Highness. There was silence and the girl looked away from the golden-haired man and thought it was awkward. Unexpectedly, His Highness held out a glass of water glass to the girl. This drew the girl's attention and also surprised him. He asked her if she wanted a drink. The girl looked at that glass of water awkwardly. Looking directly into his eyes, she mentally noted that this man had the eyes of a dangerous man. The next moment, His Highness, without waiting for any response from the girl, sped some water from the glass. He moved closer to the girl, and she didn't understand what the man was doing. The next moment, he kissed the girl, and she was just shocked, mentally asking what the hell he was doing. The girl began to shiver. Mentally, she was talking about how she was choking and couldn't breathe because of the water the man was pouring into her through the kiss. She clamped her eyes shut and blushed at what was happening, mentally asking him to stop. Some drops of water ran down her chin. The man opened his eyes during the kiss. The girl continued to shiver violently. 
His Highness pulled back from the girl and looked at her intently and thoughtfully. Suddenly, he abruptly grabbed the girl's cheeks with his hand, looked at her, and remarked aloud that she didn't seem to know how to use her tongue. It would be a shame if she dared to avoid him. The girl was horrified at what was happening. The man thought for a moment and then said the name Legria, saying that, yes, from now on, the girl's name is Legria. The blushing girl continued to stare at the man, mentally noting that she was now sure that the man was crazy. Another day came. Everything was happening in the Imperial Palace of the Bellagram Empire. The girl was sitting on the sofa in her room. She was holding tightly onto the back of the couch and breathing heavily. Mentally, she shared that it had been five days since she woke up in this world. She was clearly having a hard time holding onto the headboard. Being in a sitting position on the couch, the girl was shaking all over. After gaining strength and holding on tightly to the backrest, she put her feet up on the couch. She noticed that she could move her arms and lower body, but she wasn't able to walk yet. Putting her face to the sun that shone from the window, the girl covered her eyes and enjoyed its rays. Exhaling heavily, the girl opened her eyes and stared out the window she was sitting on the couch next to. She noticed that the only thing she could see through the window was the vast forest that surrounded the building. Exhaling, she thought about the fact that she wished she knew where she was after all. Suddenly, the door to her room opened and a severe-looking lady with glasses appeared on the doorstep. With her head held high, she walked straight towards the girl. Her servants on either side of her bowed. As she approached the girl, she started touching her feet. The girl shared that these ladies only come for a couple of minutes a day to examine her. Therefore, she doesn't think it involves anything illegal or strange. The leading older woman flashed her probing gaze at the two girls. She began to massage the girl with the two of them. The redhead realized that they would immediately rush over if she made the slightest sound or move. They observed these girls, realizing that it was obvious that they were obviously set to watch her. But since the red-haired girl cannot walk, escaping is out of the question. She covered her eyes and turned her head toward the sun. She realized in her mind that it was better not to provoke anyone until she had a chance to escape. She just needed to hide her emotions and stay calm and collected. She remembered the words she had been told in her past life that she wasn't born a genius. So she needed to control her mind, hide her emotions, stay calm, don't laugh or cry carelessly. After all, what if her sister took a bad example from her and failed in the competition? The girl remembered that her mother had said these words to her. She repeated them over and over again. She listened attentively to her, and she repeated many times that the emotions of others have a powerful influence on her sister. The girl clenched her hands into a fist trem, bling at these moments. Her mother added that if the girl couldn't do anything on her own, she should at least not stand in her sister's way. So the girl suppressed all feelings and gave up everything she wanted to do. Every day, they tried to adapt to their surroundings and avoid problems. She remembered her mother yelling at her, calling her a useless wench, and asking her why she wasn't saying anything if she was even listening to her. But then someone called her name, Legria, and tore her away from the memories. That golden-haired man was standing next to her. He was looking at her intently, and she was clearly surprised by his appearance. On the table next to him was a tray of fresh, ripe strawberries, bright red in color. The man called the girl somewhat cranky and held out a single strawberry to her lips. He pointed out that it had been five days since the girl had woken up, and she should be able to eat at least some fruit or berries. The girl looked at him awkwardly and, in the next instant, ate the strawberry he held with his fingers close to her lips. He complimented her, calling her a good girl. The girl started chewing the strawberry. Meanwhile, the man, his highness, spoke in another language incomprehensible to the girl. She couldn't understand a word. He was talking to the older woman who had come to check on the girl's condition. Lagria realized that it was definitely not English and began to speculate. It could be sex, Romanian, or Bulgarian. The next moment, the man said the girl's name again, Legria immediately drawing her attention to himself. 
He put his hand over his heart and introduced himself as Rahaik Barakiel Balagram. The girl tried to say his name, first just Ra and then his full name. Rahik, he responded by pointing his finger at her, saying her name was Lagria. The girl was outraged by this. She mentally noted that it wasn't that because he'd been telling her name for five days. She waved her hand, saying indignantly aloud that, no, it was not her name, and she wanted to tell her name. But she was silent because she couldn't remember her name. Out loud, she wondered what her name was. In this world, she was a fucked up high society bitch. A girl with a screwed up personality, a poisonous summer hedge flower, a woman who wouldn't die even if she drank pesticides. She was the nightmare of the entire empire, Beatrice Rommel. Rahik hit the desk with all his might, which startled the archbishop very much. The heads of animals, a moose and a lion, hung in the study, their eyes glowing. It was the archbishop's office in the high church. The atmosphere was oppressive. Crown Prince Rahaik, who was sitting in the chair, was obviously very angry as if a sheath of electric charge surrounded him. The archbishop, from all this terrifying atmosphere, sat trembling across from Rahik. The crown prince seriously asked the archbishop if he wanted to tell Rahaik that it was a woman, Beatrice Rommel, the future crown princess. The archbishop laughed awkwardly and replied that it was as if the soul inside this body belonged to another being. Rahaik asked the archbishop in return if he thought him a fool. The archbishop of the Belagram Empire's highest temple was a complete man. He questioned the crown prince. He flinched. Rahik continued that he could try to hide it as much as he wanted, but he would not hide the truth from him. Rahaik knew that the soul of a sacred being goes into the divine vessel that is best compatible with it. He tossed a giant long scroll onto the table that separated him and the archbishop. The crown prince had shared that he had asked his men to gather all information about Beatrice Rommel, and Rahik's gaze locked onto the last three lines in that scroll. The girl had made her younger brother, Dietrich Rommel, blind by piercing his eyes with a shard of glass, and the reason for her action is unknown. After this situation, the family punished her severely after which the girl volunteered to become a divine vessel. The archbishop replied that Lady Beatrice, that is Lady Allegria, was about to be ready to go to the imperial palace. He also remarked that, in truth, the girl is already showing some elegance. Rahik replied that the wedding was just around the corner. The archbishop was silent at his words, but the man was obviously nervous and sweating terribly on the subject. Rahik went on to say seriously that countless people wanted the blessing of a woman who came from their divine world. In this regard, Lagria must be perfect. She and Rahik's wedding was six months away. At that time, she needs to rewrite her reputation as a fucked up bitch and turn into a noble crown princess. We returned as Rahik was feeding the girl Lagria fresh, juicy, ripe strawberries. There was only one strawberry left on the plate. Rahaik shared with the girl that sacred beings react the same when they realize the situation they find themselves in. He took the last strawberry in his hand and went on to say that the creatures then cried for days on end, throwing curses around or denying the new reality altogether, hiding their ears and eyes from the truth. But he noticed that the girl calmly realized and accepted what was happening. At that moment, he brought the last strawberry to the girl's lips, and she opened her mouth to eat it. But Rahik didn't put the strawberry down. He just picked up her lower lip with his finger, much to the girl's surprise. He assumed that it was as if the girl had learned to discard everything and give up from an early age. He ran his thumb over her lip. The girl recoiled from him, and Rahik wondered aloud if there was a strange elegance in her subdued gaze. Suddenly, Lagria screamed, calling Rahaik a pervert and asking if he had a fetish for tongues. She asked him why he was picking on him like that. Had he gone completely insane and called him crazy? Rahik smiled and repeated the way she called him crazy perverted, and he thought that there was something to it. He shared aloud that he wondered what kind of face the girl would make when she found out that he understood her every word. 
The girl thought he was upset and clenched her hands into a fist and wondered what she should do. She needed to come to her senses, after all. You can't provoke Rehaik. She held up her hands harmlessly, apologizing to him for getting angry. She didn't mean it, and it wasn't his fault. Just being cooped up alone is pretty sad. She was sorry. Suddenly, she asked him to listen. She had a request. She asked him if he could bring her a map, a flat one like that. She added that she wanted a map and repeated in English how they say map. She awkwardly asked Rahik if he was listening to her. Meanwhile, the man again held out the last strawberry to the girl's cubes. The girl, in turn, was a bit puzzled by it. She looked at him, and their gazes met. Lagria exhaled heavily, then opened her mouth to eat that strawberry. Rahik, meanwhile, said aloud that unlike the original mistress of this body, the girl would be easier to handle. He didn't give her a strawberry again, but placed his thumb on her bottom lip. The girl covered her eyes and exhaled heavily. His actions mortified her, and Rahik was smiling at her. Ligria looked at the man, seeing him smirk. The girl wondered if he thought she was a puppet that was already under his control. She mentally set her mind to trying to deal with that language at least a little. Until then, she needs to pretend to be obedient so she will eat whatever she can and wear whatever she is given. The girl smiled sweetly, which surprised Rahik slightly. He silently continued to look at the girl attentively. Suddenly, he ran his hand through her red hair to a place near her ear. At that moment, Crown Prince Rahik realized that he had never thought that such a fragile living creature, who could only rely on him, would give him such pleasure. It's so exciting for him. His eyebrows shifted on the bridge of his nose and his gaze became frantic. He touched his fingers to the girl's cheek, who covered one eye at his actions. He realized, however, that he needed to wait, for the appearance of the girl was the result of a summoning ceremony at which prayers had been poured for a thousand days. Every living being must be at those tender feet, and then he would be perfect. Rahik suddenly approached the girl. Liguria didn't understand why he had moved closer. She wondered what he was even trying to do. He placed her hand sharply on his chest and shouted for him to listen. Rahik froze. The girl added that she wanted to look in the mirror. She was very uncomfortable and started trying to explain to him if he knew the object that would show her her reflection. She added that she wanted to see her face. Liguria began to pronounce the mirror in English so that Rahik could understand precisely what the girl meant. The girl was still holding on to Crown Prince Rahik's uniform. He thought about it and remarked aloud that the girl seemed to know at least four divine languages. He was very impressed by this since, in this world, only members of the imperial family and linguists could learn several languages. Rahik released the girl's hands from his uniform with his hand, answering her that she would see herself on the day of the sacred spring ceremony, so she should wait a little longer. In the next instant, he reached his lips to one of her hands to kiss her. After that, Rahik got up from the couch and the girl remained sitting on the sofa uncomprehendingly. She wondered what Rahik had just asked if he really understood her. Meanwhile, the crown prince turned to the maid named Eos. The maid replied that she was listening to him. Rahik told her that the girl's condition seemed to have improved so that they could serve her a proper meal. He added that he was going to the divine shrine to prepare for the ceremony. Liguria stared after him and said the names Eos, Elaine, and Shah. The next moment, we find ourselves in the basement of the divine sanctuary of the Temple of the Sacred Spring. That was where Crown Prince Rahik had come. He was coming down the stairs. He was immediately met by the Archbishop, who fell to the floor and bowed to greet His Highness. As he rose to his feet, the archbishop smiled broadly at the crown prince, who in turn remarked that if he smiled so broadly, his mouth would tear. The archbishop laughed but assured him that such a thing would not happen. Following Rahik, he inquired how the divine being was feeling. He added that he understood His Highness's frustration at not even being able to talk. Rahik replied that he had never had a pet before. He wondered if it was similar. 
The archbishop shared that he was worried that the highness would be displeased because who would have thought that a vessel from the Ramo family would be chosen? Rahaik replied that it was even better because Duke Rommel always finds some excuse to remain neutral. Already mentally, the crown prince added that he would now drag Duke Rommel to his side. He was most likely hoping for his daughter's return. There were even rumors that he was going to marry off a lord of the Severic family, who also remained neutral. But in the end, things turned out differently. Rahik noticed that there was yet to be an official announcement of which family the next crown princess would be from. There would definitely be unrest in the empire after the ceremony. After all, everyone would be terrified that the princess was a rabid dog. But a poisonous plant can be a cure if used correctly. Rahik said in a solemn voice with a touch of rage that everyone was so stupid. Small discharges of lightning went through his body. The archbishop behind him shook with fear and replied to his highness that he was absolutely right. After all, if their child inherited the same bold spirit as Lady Beatrice, his highness could conquer an entire continent. At these words, the archbishop glowed and began to jump for joy at what a fantastic future awaited them. Rahik replied in a solemn voice that he was overdoing it with flattery. The archbishop hesitated, saying that they would like to prepare and asked his highness where he would be staying after the sacred spring ceremony. Rahik replied that he wasn't sure yet. The archbishop motioned for his highness to keep in mind that he can rest not only in the imperial palace but also in the divine sanctuary. After all, this is the haven for every sacred knight. We are told that the holy knights are superhumans who are the main force of the Belegram Empire. They are usually born with the blood of a divine being. One mother can only give birth to one such child, and the child will receive a strong blessing, regardless of gender. The first blessing of a sacred night happened in the 15th century. It allowed the use of an extraordinary power, but they needed a divine being to survive. The longer a sacred night uses this power, the more they will go insane. Rahik noticed that it was the divine being that could quickly stabilize this madness. The grown man whose office Rahik was in wanted to say something but didn't. A moment later, he began to speak of Rahik's mother, who had died while he was still young. She was a divine being. He was a grown man with wrinkles and scars, the emperor of Belegram. He shared with his son that he should have comforted and soothed his mother, but he could not. The emperor approached his son and placed his wiry hand on his shoulder. Rahik turned to his majesty and bowed to him. The emperor added that war with the Aridum Empire was inevitable. Therefore, his son, the crown prince of the Belegram Empire, must find a mate before the battle begins. After all, Rahik's blessing can only fully unfold around her. This was Rahik's memory. At this moment, the archbishop called out to his highness, Rahik shared aloud with the archbishop that the holy knight's attraction to a divine being was a fate that concerned even him. He would inevitably submit and fall on his knees before this fragility. The archbishop listened to him attentively. The crown prince went on to say that he grew up seeing sacred knights go mad because they couldn't find a mate. Some went into a rage when a divine being refused to become a partner and others chose the path of self-destruction when their mate died. But Crown Prince Rahik has no intention of repeating their mistakes. He confidently declared that the girl, a divine being, would completely obey him. After all that was said, he ordered the archbishop to prepare for the ceremony, but the latter suddenly asked his highness to wait. Rahik, already about to leave, stopped and turned around, looking at the archbishop. With all his respect for the crown prince, the archbishop thought he should ask the question. The barbarian that Rahik had put in the dungeon still hadn't eaten anything. Reluctantly, the archbishop inquired if this barbarian was going to die. Rahik told him that barbarians lived for a very long time, and he could survive even by eating insects on the walls of the cell, so the archbishop did not need to worry. He then asked what the barbarian's name was. The archbishop replied that his name seemed to be vacant. Meanwhile, this Viking's eyes were glowing bright blue in the darkness. The next moment we see a clear day, 
a forest near the palace, where two girls are busy gathering plants. One of them addressed the other, calling her Celine and then saying that she didn't have a question. Celine, in response, wondered what that question was. The girl inquires of her interlocutor, Why is Mormala so expensive? Celine asked her if she understood. The Mormala is a unique plant that only grows in the sacred forest that surrounds the sanctuary. The girl was surprised that it was a particular plant. Celine pointed out that it was indeed. Meanwhile, Lagria was eating her meal. Two maids were serving her at once. We are told that when a divine being inhales an odor or consumes a meal containing a powder of mormal, the stress of entering a new environment is significantly reduced, which then helps to deal with the rejection of the body. And the most essential thing in this is that the divine being will become less wary of the people of this world. Lagria, meanwhile, mentally repeated the names of the maids, Eos, Abba, Alan. The maids themselves spoke a different language. Selene cheerfully stated that perhaps the incongruous calmness of the divine being was a credit to the powder of the Momala. Selene's companion remarked that the girl was a lady of the House of Rommel. Selene admiringly noted that the girl had such a gentle gaze. It is said that divine beings are usually furious upon arrival, but this girl is completely different, her eyes full of virtue. Selene enthusiastically said that she massaged her hands, and the divine being thanked her for all her appearance, so maybe she would make her her priestess maid. These words of Selene infuriated the third girl, who grinned and clenched her teeth at her words. She sharply and aggressively yelled for Selene to stop barking. This girl then asked if Selene had any self-respect. As she approached Selene with a crazy smile, she asked her if the girl wanted to take advantage of the stupid divine creature and get ahead. Selene, dumbfounded and clearly nervous, replied that no, that wasn't it. The girl asked what it was then, and after that, she kicked the tray of Mormolo with her foot, which tipped over. The girl indignantly continued that they were poking around and a divine being couldn't eat what they cooked for her. She didn't understand why they had to serve her. Was it only because the shrine's apprentices were the lowest rank? Celine turned to the girl named Anita, telling her not to take her anger out on the girl. Celine then added that gathering herbs was their job, and she thought the divine being needed clarification. Anita was furious and asked Celine what she had just said. Then she grabbed her by the collar, lifting her to her feet. The girls behind them were dumbfounded and frightened by what was happening. Anita turned to Celine. She remarked that Celine stutters all the time when she's nervous. She's just a loser. Anita confidently stated that a divine being would never be interested in such a stuttering idiot. Therefore, Celine needs to come to her senses. Anita called her a dumbass, after which tears ran down Celine's face in fear. Dark clouds came to the Empire and rained down on the Imperial Palace. Eos went to the Divine Being's chambers and noticed that she had not gotten up yet. The girl pretended to cough. Lagria said Eos, Alan, and Abert's names aloud at the exact moment, assuming a sitting position on the bed. She remembered that they say humans are the best at adapting. But no one was teaching her a new language. Eos went to the window in Lagria's chambers and opened it wide open, rain pouring down behind her. Lagria sat on the edge of the bed, planning to rise. She mentally exhaled and concluded that if she listened quietly in time, she would be able to memorize some of the words. She was already confidently on her feet and walked to the window. Eos bowed to her. A fresh, cool breeze from the street blew in on Lagria. The girl closed her eyes in bliss and assumed that it looked like it was going to be a rainy day. Opening her eyes, she smiled genuinely and said aloud that it was pleasant enough. Standing nearby, Eos asked Lagria if she was tired of sitting in this room. Then she said that His Highness wanted to have tea with her in the garden of the sanctuary. She thought it would be good for the girl to get some fresh air, even in rainy weather. Lagria listened to the girl attentively, but mentally noted that she still understood almost nothing. Boeing, Eos said. Jay Lagria shot Chai Ten. 
Lagria herself remarked that she was pleased to hear at least one familiar word, if only like. At the maid's words, she smiled sweetly. Eos clapped her hands together, shouting for people to come in. At the same instant, the door to the divine being's chambers opened, and several racks of clothes went in at once. Eos noticed that it was the first time the girl was leaving the room, so his highness asked for special attention. The maid pointed out that these were the newest dresses created by the best designers in the empire. Lagria mentally paused and wondered if it was really all for her. She walked beside each rack and gazed at them with admiration and inordinate amazement, barely covering her ajar mouth. One dress, one noticed, had a bow the size of her head, and another had a bunch of ribbons. Seeing one dress that was green and decorated with red flowers, she realized that she didn't think she would wear one even if they gave it to her for free. One rack was covered and walking over to it, she wondered what it was. When she threw the cape off of that rack, she saw utterly different sets of underwear there. Lagria was shocked and outraged at what she saw. Eo smiled sweetly as she said that this would be useful for another time at the ceremony. But now they were going to the garden, so they should wear something else. Eos nudged Lagria away from the rack of underwear. The girl at this point wondered why they would have such lingerie here. Eos set the girl down on a chair. Meanwhile, the older woman was choosing a dress for the divine being, and after choosing one, she showed it to Lagria, asking her what about this dress. Lagria walked closer to it, and while examining it, she noticed that the dress was simple with almost no jewelry. It was neat and looked cheaper. Taking the hem and feeling the fabric, she realized that it fit perfectly, so that she would choose it. Suddenly, Rahik appeared and asked the girls if they were done, collapsing on a chair in the divine being's chambers. He asked them to hurry up, for he didn't want to waste time. The older woman nervously turned to his highness. Lagria looked awkwardly at Rahik, and he looked carefully at her in return. The next moment, we see the older maid crying with delight and Eos smiling sweetly. Lagria was dressed up. She was in her chosen dress. Her hair was perfectly styled and had a barrette in the form of a red flower with burgundy ribbons. The girl was thinking at that moment that she did not understand the man's intentions, but his voice sounded music to her ears. Lagria looked extremely cute and radiant, she thought. This is how everything is going well. An older woman approached her and delightedly shared that the willowy fabric was almost no different from other fabrics, but was known for its durability. If a girl stepped on it, it wouldn't tear and the green color was so beautiful. The woman also shared that the Mittenbaum Boutique is the only one in the empire. What could such an outfit do without using toxic materials? Rocky walked over to the girl and looked at her thoughtfully taking strands of her hair in his hand. He noted that he didn't like it and that the girl looked more like a mess. Looking at his face, the girl replied aloud that judging from his face, he didn't like the outfit, after which she remarked that he had bought it for her himself. Rahai smiled at her words and noted that it was her truth. He then turned to the maids, saying that he had ordered something special and ordered them to bring it. The maids responded positively to his highness. The eldest maid brought a whole tray of one ornament of different colors. Rocky thought it would look good on the girl. Looking at them, the girl was puzzled and assumed they were dog collars and wondered if he had a dog, for she had never seen one. Rahik, meanwhile, took one of the collars, the white one. Then he walked toward the girl and approached her from behind. Placing his hands on her shoulders, he mused aloud that any color would suit her pale skin. The girl was shocked. She couldn't believe what was happening. She knew he was fucked. But this, Rahik, at this point, put a white collar around her neck. After that, he whispered in her ear that now he liked everything. The girl's hands were near the collar of her neck. They were shaking frantically. The girl couldn't believe it. She denied it, for she couldn't wear the collar. She didn't want to. Lagria clutched at the collar with her hands in an attempt to tear it off. She mentally declared that she was a human, not a dog. But suddenly, someone T.S. casked. She was immediately distracted from trying to rip the collar off. 
She froze, still holding it in her hands. She realized someone had clucked their tongue and turned her attention to the maid. Maids are standing nearby. Eos nodded gently, and the older woman looked at the girl nervously. Lagria realized that even they didn't like her pathetic look. In the next instant, Rocky took her hand and, leaning closer to her, spoke her name, telling her to stop. He added, telling her not to hurt herself anymore, for her body belonged to him. The girl looked extremely sad and disappointed when, at that moment, Rocky put his arm around her. In her mind, she told him to do whatever he wanted, for she had already given up, for no one here would help her anyway. She realized that it was the man, Rahik, who held all the power in his hands. Suddenly, someone tisked, tisked again and remarked that it was annoying. Then the voice complimented for the girl to do the same to him. Lagria felt as if she had been electrocuted. Her head felt as if it were ready to split in two. Rocky called the girl's name questioningly. The girl grabbed her head. The maids also called out to Lady Lagria, but the girl began to faint, wondering what was happening, her body not obeying. Rocky caught the girl who had passed out. He was concerned and puzzled by her condition and what was happening. The strange voice was calling for Lagria. The girl was lying in a stone gazebo outside, covered with a plaid. The voice kept calling her until, at one point, she opened her eyes, crouching where she had slept. Lagria looked around, wondering where she was. Eos was running towards the pavilion, calling out to Lady Legria and noting that she was finally awake. Lagria called out to the maid by name. The maid sadly replied that she was so worried when Lady Lagria suddenly passed out. After that, she began to ask how she was feeling. Eos snickered as she advised to postpone the tea party because she was worried about Lady Lagria's health, but his highness, Eo sobbingly asked the lady why she had done that, and she was fortunate that he had forgiven her this time, but such behavior was unacceptable. Lagria replied to Eos that she didn't understand anything and asked her to slow down. Eos continued to speak, annoyed, asking if the lady knew how the maid was worried about her, then asked her to please not do that again or Lady Lagria would be in trouble. Lagria turned away, exhaled heavily, and mentally remarked that it was so frustrating that they didn't speak the same language. Eos immediately, worriedly, asked the girl what was wrong. She was not feeling well. Lagria turned away from the girl and sat with a calm face. Eos rushed out of the pavilion, yelling for the girl to wait a second. The maid ran to get the doctor. Lagria was left alone, staring awkwardly at Eos's awkwardly fleeing footsteps. Suddenly, someone shouted how infuriating it was, followed by an indignant question as to why they had to dig in the grass in the middle of the rain, and people were soaked to the skin. Lagria turned her attention to these girls. Anita immediately turned her attention to the divine being sitting in the pavilion. She didn't understand why she was sitting there and wondered why she was wearing a dog collar. The girl next to her sadly commented that they were working without respite and that the divine creature was sitting there relaxing. After that, the girl added that she hated her so much. A moment later, Anita turned to Salim before grabbing her by the neck and dropping the girl to the ground. Sline was puzzled by Anita's actions, and the latter, in turn, asked Sline if she could see what was around the divine being's neck. She told her to look more closely, for it was a dog collar, so Sline should become one if she wanted to serve this girl. Lagria looked at them, puzzled, not realizing what they were doing. She wondered if they were out there bullying a girl. She realized it was the same one after all. From the company of these girls came the sounds that dogs met. Woof, woof, Lagria was dumbfounded to hear this. Antia, meanwhile, asked Celine whether she could see what the girl was telling her. The divine being didn't care about Celine. Anita took a crying Celine by the hair, telling her not to even dream of becoming a priestess, then called her a stupid stutterer. Sobbing, Celine asked Anita to stop. Lagria mentally begged them to stop. It was too cruel. She was human, too. The girl touched her collar at that moment, mentally saying that Celine was not a dog. Lagria covered her eyes. Realizing the sadness of the situation, 
She thought she was going to lose her mind for sure. Tugging the collar around her neck, she wondered what the hell was even going on. She looked at the evil, smiling girls who were taunting Celine. She didn't understand why people were treated like this here, like they were real animals. She asked for something to be explained to her. If it were even an alien abduction, she would honestly believe it. Lagria clutched at her head, asking mentally for everyone to tell her, please. Suddenly, that strange voice came again. He cursed, saying he couldn't look at it anymore. Lagria straightened up, realizing it was that strange voice again. That voice remarked on how noisy these company girls were. Lagria stood up from her seat, not realizing what was going on as her body moved on its own. She walked barefoot away from the pavilion, straight towards that group of girls. Anita continued to mock Celine. She complimented her on her excellent barking and wondered if the girl would always talk like that so she wouldn't stutter. After that, Anita told Celine to look forward to tonight. As she did so, she continued to hold the sobbing girl by the hair. Suddenly, the group of girls were called out. It was Lagria who came up to them. She called out to them all, telling them all to come here to her. The girl's posture was confident, and her gaze was on the verge of madness and anger. The girls stood still, to which Lagria wondered why they were frozen, wondering if I thought she didn't remember them. She waved a finger at them, commanding them that they should come to her quickly. The girls started whispering. Some noted that she sounded like the fucked-up bitch that was Lady Beatrice, with some wondering if the divine being hadn't chosen her. Antine was clearly displeased. After that, she shouted at Celine to tell the truth had she lied to her. Celine needed help understanding what Anita was talking about. Anita continued to yell at Celine, reminding her that she was saying that a divine being chose this girl. Eventually, Lagria herself walked up to the girls and slapped Anita very hard. Her cheek was swollen from the blow, and she looked at Lagria with huge eyes. Anita had clearly not expected this. Lagria herself was wondering what was going on. Her body was not obeying her. Lagria called Celine, who nervously asked if she was being addressed. Lagria mentally noted that she also spoke the local language. Already out loud, Lagria said yes, Celine then told her to stop crawling on her knees and stand next to the divine being. Selim immediately stood up, responding positively to Lady Lagria. Anita was clearly annoyed and resentful of this attitude towards Selim. Anita had already shouted out loud that it wasn't fair and asked why she was only hit. Lagria looked down at Anita as she justified at that moment that it was Selim's punishment for not doing her job well. After that, Anita added that she was in charge among the students and was allowed to do such a thing. Lagria fingered Anita's chin, asking her if she had decided to ask the lady. What an impertinent thing to say. After that, Lagria smiled sweetly and said, Okay. She would pass Anita's words to his highness. Anita questioningly apologized, clearly not understanding anything. Lagria asked Anita why she was making such a face. After all, she had said it wasn't fair. Lagria tells his highness what she herself saw and about the words Anita said. Anita immediately fell face down onto the ground, apologizing, saying that she didn't mean to and she wouldn't open her mouth again, asking very much to spare her, to pardon her. After uttering this, Anita trembled in fear in front of Lady Lagria. Lagria placed her hands at her sides and smiled proudly. She mused aloud that the arrogant priestess seemed to understand her place. Then the girl felt like she'd been electrocuted again and grabbed her head. Selena immediately picked her up, turning to Lady Lagria. Lagria noticed that this time, the headache was even worse and she couldn't take it anymore. The girl fell to her knees on the ground. Selene tried to support the girl. Suddenly, masked bandits appeared behind the priestesses. Someone shouted that there were intruders there. Trespass. Another person had already shouted for them to flee, but another person replied that they would be punished. They had to protect a divine being. Celine, holding Lady Legria, turned to her. She told the lady that these brigands had come for her and she needed to get to safety. One of the brigands stated that they would not touch the priestesses. 
they could shower her, a divine being. He implied that they wouldn't want to spill any extra blood, so he was offering the priestesses a choice. Anita looked at the brigand carefully, after which she stood up and told them to go. The other two girls were shocked by Anita's statement. Meanwhile, Anita told them to leave her. But with the exclamations of the two girls, she asked them, do they really want to die while they will protect the divine being? The girls remained silent to this question. But suddenly, Celine called Anita. Turning her attention, she shouted that Anita couldn't run away. Alone, she must do her duty to protect Lady Lagria. With a smirk, Anita asked Celine if she had completely lost her mind, after which she headed away and the other two girls followed her. Celine sat next to Lady Anita as she did so. She was outraged by the girls' behavior. Lastly, she shouted at them that they were cowards. Abruptly, one of the brigands appeared behind her, flashing daggers. Celine shouted loudly to Lady Lagria not to worry because the priestess would stay here and protect. After that, the girl grabbed the tray and flew towards one of the brigands. Lagria watched with cloudy eyes as priestess Celine tried to overpower the brigand with a single tray. She thought about the fact that she had had many hardships in her life so that she could handle a lot, but this was all too much. Celine's strength was not equal to that of the brigands, so the one she was beating lifted the girl by the throat, then threw her aside with all her might. Lady Lagria mentally wondered what the hell these brigands wanted from her if they wanted to kill her. The brigand swung his daggers straight at Lagria. The girl at that moment was thinking that yes, this would be better because she was tired. That was why. When the daggers flew towards her, she clutched her eyes hard, but they ended up flying into the ground, not far from her. When she opened her eyes, she saw Rahik's back, reflecting all the daggers with his sword. She was surprised to see him and said his name aloud in a questioning tone. Rahim gave her a severe look. He said her name in reply. The dagger that was sticking out of the ground had Rahik's reflection on one part and Legeria's on the other. Rahik asked the brigands fearfully how they dared to harm his woman. The bandits flinched at his words. The crown prince was in an intimidating rage. Lightning was shooting out of his body. Meanwhile, Lagria began to faint, thinking that she couldn't even tell if this was reality or a dream. The girl covered her eyes, declaring that she couldn't take it anymore. We got back to the moment when Rahik put the white collar around Lagria's neck, and after she passed out, the girl almost immediately woke up saying that, on second thought. Pink would be much better. Rahik was clearly surprised by what was happening. Eos turned to his highness, asking what was going on. Lagria asked Rahik if he could stand her up. He set the girl down smoothly and received her thanks. The girl made her way to the maids, one of whom was holding a tray of collars. Lagria hesitated and took the pink one. She wondered how to open that collar. Rahik, who had come up behind her, told her to pull both sides and close it by pressing the snap. The girl gasped when she succeeded and realized that all she had to do was pull. And then, in the next instant, she had the pink collar around the neck of Crown Prince Rahik himself, who was clearly amazed. The maids were shocked, saying Lordy and turning to his highness. Looking at him, Lagria smiled, saying she thought so. Pink looks great. After this, she said that it suited Rahik very well. He is like that, but she didn't have time to add a cute puppy. Lagria opened her eyes abruptly. The girl was lying in bed in her chambers. She looked out the window where it was still raining. She wondered what had happened, whether she had survived. Turning around, she saw Rahik sleeping on the other side of the bed. She mentally said his name. The girl noticed the very pink collar around his neck. She wondered if he had saved her life. The girl started to reach her hand into his collar. Suddenly, he opened his eyes and smiled, asking the girl if she was awake. Lagria smiled weakly at him, blushing slightly. Rahik shared with Lagria that she seemed to be in severe shock. The girl worriedly asked what exactly was going on because she didn't understand what was happening to her at all. Razik piped up that it was fascinating. Lagria wondered what exactly was interesting. The crown prince replied that he would like to ask the girl the same questions, then asked how she could speak their language and what had happened to her.
Lagria clutched her face, saying that she didn't know. She only remembered that she had a bad headache and she heard some voice she didn't recognize and then her body moved on its own. Then the girl shockedly realized that, but before she could say a word, Rahik took her by the arms and pulled her to him, pulling her down on the bed. He looked her straight in the eyes and a moment later, he covered them and told her that everything was already in the past, so she should forget because nothing would change and she should rely on him. Lagria looked at him with surprised eyes. After a moment, Rahik put his hand on her shoulder and pressed the girl against his chest. Lagria was very confused and asked him what he was doing. Rahik replied with closed eyes that the girl was soaked in the rain and was freezing hard. The girl raised her head. They met eyes and Rahik put his hand on her waist and pulled her closer to him and kissed the top of her head telling her that he was trying to warm her up with his body heat. The girl shouldn't think that anyone wants to hurt her, so she should relax and rest. Lagria thought about how sometimes she thought Rahik was missing a couple of screws in his head. But although it seemed delusional, he didn't try to touch her breasts or anything, so he didn't seem like such a wrong person. She remembered that rack of very revealing lingerie and assumed that maybe that lingerie was for some other woman. Her eyes slowly closed. Lagria thought about the fact that she couldn't remember the last time she slept next to someone. Passing out, Lagria thanked Rahik for saving her tonight. Rahik opened his eyes and smiled at her words before going to sleep. After a moment, he closed his eyes himself and buried his nose in her hair. Sometime later at night, Rahik left Lady Legre's chambers, leaving the soundly sleeping girl alone in bed. Eos was telling his highness in the corridor that the body collector of Kwaiza had left a note demanding compensation for the murdered assassins, after which she added that if they were not given the money, they would haunt them until they died. Rahak answered them to get their compensation. Eos observed that their methods were disgusting. They dared to demand money for the people who came to take Lady Lagria's life. Eos exhaled asking how one could ask for compensation for the deaths of assassins. Rahik replied that any organization that does such things is doomed to remain in the shadows, but not the quiz organization, which has the nerve to come out into the world. Rahik remarked that their master loves money too much. He's generally willing to dig through garbage to pick up a dime. That dirty bastard would never work at a loss to himself. Rahik removed his pink collar from around his neck and placed it in Eowas's hands as she asked if his highness had any guesses as to who was behind all of this. Rahik shared his thoughts that the culprit who would leave this order was definitely from a neutral faction. Eos was surprised by the crown prince's response. Radhika began to list all the factions after all, whether it was the emperor's faction that led with him the neutral faction that gathered around Duke Rommel's summer hedge, or the faction of Archduke Moscrato, Rahik's uncle. They all have the same goal of gathering as many forces on their side as possible. Count Rommel planned to strengthen his faction, using his daughter and had no intention of joining other groups. That's why Count Rommel wanted to betroth her to a man from another family that adheres to neutrality. Among them, there will surely be many people who don't want to see Duke Rommel's daughter as a crown princess because it would significantly affect his future decisions. Rahik summarized after all of the above that this is precisely what those who hired the assassins are trying to avoid. He then asked Essios to send someone to keep an eye on Archduke Mosgrado because he is practically devoid of followers, but still has a motive to attack Allegria. Eos bowed to his highness. He realized that as the rumor spread, the nobles would start acting in their interests and the culprit would be among them. Rahik summed up that they must turn the situation in their favor as quickly as possible. The next moment, we see Rahik coming into the basement of the sanctuary. The archbishop is lying on the floor in front of him, asking his highness for forgiveness. The archbishop shared that he couldn't believe that such a thing happened a couple of days before the sacred ceremony and he had no excuse. Rahik walked past the archbishop, asking the archbishop if he had fun with a lot of money and now he is afraid of going to hell. 
He looked angrily at the archbishop, saying that if the future crown princess is killed on the temple grounds, did the archbishop guess who would be responsible for this? The archbishop was frightened. He knew perfectly well who would be responsible. After a moment, the archbishop fell to the floor and began to bang his head, telling his highness that it was all his fault. He assured him that he would increase the number of guards and strengthen the inner defenses of the sanctuary so that not even a fly could get through. Meanwhile, Rahik sat down in his chair. He asked the archbishop if the temple had suffered any damage. Standing on all fours, the archbishop blanched and replied awkwardly that the apprentices in the priestess's place had not sustained any damage. The archbishop got up off the floor, and Rahik meanwhile quipped that not killing someone until they pay is definitely a quiz. Rahik added that the girls would be punished for running away rather than protecting the princess. The crown prince also asked the archbishop if it was confirmed that there was one girl among the girls who had been disrespected in Liguria. The archbishop replied that, yes, that girl's name was Anita. He also remarked that she was the leader of all the students with good grades, but this girl would stop at nothing to get ahead. The archbishop also indignantly added that Anita, that fool, had told outrageous lies when she was being interrogated. Rahik inquired as to what the lies were. The archbishop replied that the girl spoke as if the future crown princess was communicating in their language and slapped the girl in the face. Rahik questioned in surprise about the moment that Ligria hit the girl. The archbishop continued, saying that Anita had said that Lady Ligria was like Beatrice Rommel. Rahik hesitated for a moment. He remembered the moment with the pink collar. After a moment, he ordered the archbishop not to punish the female students who had run away, for now, to leave them alone. The archbishop apologized questioningly, getting up from his seat. Rahik replied that the girls must have a reason why they behaved so arrogantly. He then remarked that he had to go. He wanted to meet Duke Rommel in secret. As he left, Rahik told the archbishop that he would be back for the ceremony and that he should make sure that Ligria did not leave her bedroom. The calmed archbishop responded affirmatively to the crown prince's request and wished his highness a safe journey. However, Rahik remembered something, glanced at the archbishop, and said one more thing. One should put all the available formula powder into the spring. The archbishop asked in surprise about all of it. Rahik wondered if there was a problem. The archbishop said no, but he said it would be costly because a kilogram of powder was ten times more expensive than a kilogram of gold. But the archbishop was immediately silenced when Rahik pointed her sword at him, which was being struck by a discharge of golden lightning. Staring madly at the archbishop, the crown prince asked if this was more valuable than his life. The archbishop sobbing raised his hands in an innocuous gesture, then added that if you thought so, they could provide everything for free and laughed awkwardly. The day of the sacred ceremony came. Eos and the older woman were already in Lady Ligria's chambers. They both joyfully announced to Delhi Ligria that today was the day. Liguria looked at them incomprehensibly. They both congratulated her joyfully on the ceremony. Liguria asked them what they were talking about. What ceremony? Eos clapped her hands, saying that Prince Rahik would be here soon. They should get ready. The older woman rolled in a covered rack. Liguria asked Eos to wait, to slow down because she didn't understand what they were talking about. What ceremony? The older woman took the cape off the rack, saying that everything was ready. What she saw shocked Liguria. Eos cheerfully remarked that at last. But the older woman, meanwhile, took a white-colored undergarment from the rack and cheerfully announced that it was time for ceremonial clothing. Crown Prince Rahik walked down the corridor and inquired about the preparations for the sacred ceremony. The attendant replied that the preparations were almost finished. Lady Ligria would be taken to the spring when she got on the palanquin. Suddenly, someone shouted to stay back. Rahik's attention was immediately drawn to it. It was all coming from Lady Ligria's chamber, where the crown prince was actually going. The girl asked the maids if they really thought she would wear such a thing. The maids told her that now was not the time to be stubborn. 
and she had better get dressed before His Highness arrived. The girl said that no, she looked pathetic as it was. Liguria covered herself with a pillow. She was sitting right at the headboard of the bed, and D.O.S. was standing on the opposite side of the bed with her underwear. The girl's gazes collided in a struggle. Suddenly, the crown prince appeared in the chambers, turned to Eos, and asked her what was going on. Eos was surprised to see his highness. Liguria was not confused, however, and asked Rahik indignantly, with a hint of anger, what was going on and why the maids were trying to put this stupid linen on her. Rahik waved his hand at the assistant, and told the girl that it was easier when she was crying in his arms, but now she was stubborn. The assistant pulled out a pink vial. Liguria innocently remarked that she thought for a second that Rahik was a kind person, and now it was such a disappointment. Rahik approached the girl, saying that it was strange since he thought she was treated very well, and complimented her by saying he would change if they were rude to her. Liguria indignantly told him not to make her laugh, for everyone had been kind to her except him, and if he were to replace someone, he would have to change himself. Rahik took the vial from the assistant in his hand and answered the girl that he was afraid it was impossible. In the next instant, Rahik sprayed the contents of the vial directly onto Liguria. The girl started to speak his name indignantly, but in a second, her eyes slowly began to close, and eventually, the girl shoved with Rahik catching her hand. Smiling, he replied to the sleeping girl that no one could replace him. He then announced to the maids that they would forget about the palanquin and he would carry the princess himself. The maids answered in the affirmative to his highness's order. Liguria slept sweetly. The next moment we find ourselves in a divine sanctuary. The spring is covered with regular. Liguria, sleeping on the floor of the sanctuary, began to wake up. She looked around and wondered where she was. The girl was wearing a short white shirt, which she had put on after all. Suddenly, Rahik, who had appeared behind her, answered her question, saying that this place was called a sacred spring. The girl was surprised to hear his voice and turned to see him. Rahik would add that any dirt can be washed away this spring. Liguria asked indignantly who should wash away the dirt in the spring if it was her. Rahik smiled at her question and replied that it was both of them. The girl indignantly called him a pervert, for was it essential to put a small piece of cloth on her for that purpose? She asked Rahik what he was going to do to her. Rahik asked the girl to calm down and then added that she could grin all she wanted, but he would not be frightened by that. The girl stood up abruptly, saying that they were not going to. He could do what he wanted, and she was leaving. Suddenly, the girl started to fall, but Rahik picked her up, and she fell on his chest. He told her that she would not be able to move for a while, so the girl would have to rely on him. Liguria asked him what relying on meant and how she could even trust him. Rahik took his hand on her shoulder and added that resistance would do no good, and her attitude only turned the crown prince on more. Liguria asked him to wait and wondered excitedly if he was listening to her at all. He tried to remember how his phrase would sound in her language. After a moment, he remembered and said the phrase, You turn me on in Korean. The girl grinned and in the next moment slapped his chest with her palms indignantly asking if he knew Korean and if he'd been fooling the girl the whole time. Rahik grinned, saying it was nothing of the sort before scooping the girl up under her feet, lifting her in his arms and adding that he hadn't said he didn't know her language. Liguria indignantly and nervously told him to let her go. She started to go into the spring with the girl on her arm, adding that he had reasons for not reporting that he was familiar with a sort of Korean language. The number of divine languages a creature knows, and the way it behaves in different situations, helps determine a suitable knight by the rank of sacred knight. Rahik smilingly added that the girl had already been chosen as the future crown princess, so everything was just a formality. The girl in his arms looked at him angrily and frowned. The next moment we see Ligria and Rahik standing with the spring. Rahik looked at the girl's calm face, noting that she seemed more relaxed here, and shared that they had poured all the formula powder into this spring. 
Ligeria, at this point, seriously told him to answer honestly, as she had been trying to understand for a long time now, after which the girl asked the crown prince if he had kidnapped her. Perhaps the girl's mother had asked for it. Rahik inquired if it was like that. The girl called him by name, saying excitedly that she knew nothing about this place and asked him to say something. Rahik hesitated and said that he thought it was time they faced the truth. Otherwise, they were only wasting time. The girl genuinely didn't know what he was talking about. He started talking about her red hair, that it was beautiful. His words surprised the girl very much. Liguria took strands of her hair, telling him to stop changing the subject. Anyway, her hair wasn't red. It was black. She immediately remembered that she wanted to ask him what he had done to her hair. Rahik had seriously stated that she wasn't given a mirror for that very reason. The girl didn't understand what he meant. He asked the girl if she was interested in the reason, for she would know everything at once if she looked into it. But the mirror she could look into, it was in the center of the spring at the very bottom. Liguria was silent. He put his arm around her shoulders and smilingly said the girl was surprised by his actions. The girl was surprised at his actions. He put his other hand on her thigh and lifted her slightly, at that moment telling her in her ear that if she wanted, he would carry her there. The girl asked him if he thought she would beg him. Rahik replied that not really, for only a request would suffice and he might agree. Suddenly, the girl pushed herself away from Rahik and walked forward confidently, humming. She turned back to him, stating that it was better for the mirror to really be there. After which, the girl dove into the spring. Rahik was doused with a small amount of water. He silently looked at the place where the girl had just been. Liguria swam confidently into the depths of the spring. As she stopped, she noticed the terrifying depth, noting that, God, it was so deep. The girl realized that she couldn't see the bottom and wondered what she should do now since she didn't think she could make it on her own. If something went wrong, she might as well die. That thought left Ligria in shock. Suddenly, that strange voice came again. It called the girl by name and told her that it was okay. The girl shouldn't be stubborn and ask Rahik for help. After all, that's all she could do, right? Those words clearly hurt the girl. The voice said that Ligria's request would definitely please Rahik. However, the girl confidently stated that she would not rely on him. After that, the girl confidently swam further into the depths. She doesn't want to do what he wants her to do. The girl swam toward the sparkle at the bottom of the spring. She confidently answered the voice that she would not allow herself to be manipulated. The girl tried not to choke on the water at the depth of the spring. She did swim to the huge mirror at the depth of the spring and began to approach it slowly. Suddenly, that voice appeared again. She turned to Ligria and shared that she was starting to like her. This voice belonged to Betria, La Romal. In the reflection of the mirror appeared this very girl. She asked Ligria if she was well settled in the captured body, the most beautiful girl of the Empire. Regina... Then the girl looks towards the mirror or says, what the hell is happening? Am I dreaming? Then she puts her hands in her mouth or says, I have been underwater for too long. If I don't get back to the surface soon after she tries to swim out of the water, but the other girl from the mirror holds her hand. This part ends here. Thank you for watching till the end. It took a lot of time and energy to make these kinds of videos. So please subscribe to my channel to watch more interesting Manwa stories.